today I'm going to be talking about uh, how to sell in any market, but mainly how to sell in a bad market. Uh, a lot of it has to do with your thought positioning on what you're doing in your own head on selling products. Most salespeople sell themselves out of deals. I like to say, you know, keep it simple, stupid on everything you do, and it's so much easier, and you don't make near as many mistakes. See, every morning I get up and I look in the mirror after I get dressed, and the first thing I do is I tell myself somebody has to pay for this. I got up and I got dressed. That's double, two $5 bills, just because I got up and got dressed. The most important thing to me in sales is product knowledge. Yeah. If you don't know your products and you don't know why there's small differences, you don't have to know everything about every product, but you need to know a little something, if not half of something, on every single product you own. So that you have, one, the ability to show them things and for them to tell you what they're feeling, and then you can move them to the product that will work best for them. You can't do that if you don't really know what your shears are doing and what they're telling you. To really become a good listener. Nobody wants to practice selling because it's stupid. It's not stupid. I got a wife who's a stylist, so I have it a little bit easier. I can just pull her aside and say things to her and have her try stuff and listen to what she's saying, especially when I started. That was so huge. I role play with her frequently. Now, we can do it as sharpeners. Even, even over the phone, I guess you could do it. It's the whole idea of talking about product and being right with what you're saying. Perfect practice makes perfect. Practice does not make perfect. Uh, now, as you go through your sales, you know, there's like a natural progression to any sale. It's, the salesperson will talk twice as much at the beginning of your whole in, you know, encounter of setting up for sharpening, getting your shears out, getting them looking. You're talking twice as much as they are quickly moving to them talking twice as much as you are. Part of it's easy if you're sharpening while you're in the shop, but you need to get asking questions, open-ended questions. You don't want to ask a, you never want to ask a sales question where the answer is going to be yes or no. Chances are it's going to be no, if there's money involved coming out of their pocket. So you always try to answer, ask them open-ended questions, it gets them talking, and the more they talk and the better you listen, you're going to hear the little things that they say. You know, I just want to get my shears sharpened. Okay, boy, these shears are sure nice. My shears never felt like that. There's a little tip right there. You might need to talk to that person about buying that shear or another shear like it. You got to get it in their hands and get them working with them. I don't know how familiar folks are with using trial closes. Did you want one or two of those? Of course they don't want two of the same shear. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a simple question. Do you want one or two? There's no wrong answer. The right answer is, well, I just want one. Oh, I'd like to have two. Oh, that's even better. By asking a positive question like that, you're more likely to move forward in the sale. If they're saying, I'd like one, your trial close was sort of a close because you just found out they're already interested. At that point, now you start talking about, well, did you want the black, blue, or pink case with that? That's another trial close following up your trial close. Again, giving them another chance to move themselves farther down the sale. And they might say, oh, no, 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 I, I like them, but I'm, I don't know if I'm buying. Okay, that's cool. You know, at least you found out where you are in that deal and if you should spend any more time fooling around with trying to make a sale that you may or may not make. Did you want to pay for that all at once or all at one time? <laughs> it's an option, and, and believe it or not, they think about it. They, it's like, what? But have a little fun with them. You know, I, Ed last year cracked me up. He's got these little stories he can go in and say, I can't do that. It's not in my nature. So I have to find different ways to make them laugh. The enormous lady. There you go. Uh, you know, and work on your own trial closes. This is where you really need to role play. You know, with stylists, if you can, find a stylist that you've been servicing for a couple years that really likes you. You know, hey, you know, play with these shears. And she doesn't even need to know you're practicing. You could just be showing her shears and you're practicing, and she might be going, why the hell is he showing me 10 different shears and asking me to buy every one of them? If you do it right, they don't feel offended, and you're not pushy. Never pushy. Trial closes should be nice, friendly. They should be said with a smile, almost a laugh. 
Yeah, but keep it soft. Pushing shears on, like try these shears out. Be like telling me, here, try this Porsche for a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> you never buy a Porsche if you didn't drive it first, <laughs> ever. And the funny thing is, is you never know who can buy what. As we learned, I learned, especially at the shows recently with selling the show toes. I'm trying to, you know, initially I tried to show her a cheap shear and she's like, no, 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 a high end. And I'm like, God, I was way off the mark, right off the get-go there. I wasn't even in the same page. But yeah, it's, you know, be, be selective. I usually give people two, three hundred dollar shears to start with. Start them high, work them down if you have to. The selling part of this is easy. I may make this sound a little harder than it is, but I just want you to have these things in the back of your head. Sales is a game. And it's just a game of back and forth bantering to see where you're at. That's all it is. The better salespeople just learn how to listen better and close the deal when the customer says they want to buy it. And shut up when they say they want to buy it. It's, don't put your foot in your mouth if they already said they want to buy it. I've done it. I've walked money away from my hand. It happens. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They don't care. It's you know you could talk to your blue in the face about why a cobalt shear is going to cut better than a jazzy, but it really doesn't matter unless they know that you care about them. You're doing it for them. Always do it for the stylist. The most important things in any sale: like, trust, and understanding. You can make a sale without having all of these hit. Actually, there's a fourth part: luck. Luck is one percent. Like 33%, trust 33%, and understanding is 33%. It helps if you have all three of them. People buy from people they like. People buy from people they trust. And they definitely will buy from you if they understand you. And they like and trust you ahead of time. But you really got to try to get two of those. And I think part of that is by getting inside the salon, being in front of them, letting them play with your shears, letting them take the irons out, and luck's created when you prepare yourself an opportunity arises and they come together that's all luck is see getting in the door is a real simple thing for me i find it to be fun and easy and you know and when i say that every 10 shops i go to that i've never been to before i get in three of them on the first try sometimes four or five as i have my bad days too but for the most part i get in about three out of ten on a total cold call just walking right in here I am hi I'm Chuck and it's because of this that I get in the door it's nothing to do with words and you can't look good enough you, there's nothing you can do but if you have the product to walk in and pull it out you know we're talking about that gatekeeper you come in the door and they always stop you you know you're there the stylists are back you know you guys are the stylists and I'm stuck outside here you can't really see me because there always seems to be a wall in the way so you need to get over there to open up your case unless there's a stylus at the register and what I like to do is they always have room on the counter for you to open your case up to get them out of card I like to you know I come in like this I set my case on there I pull out my big flyer and I usually have my, one of my awesome nickel brochures that I just love and I got a flyer and a brochure hi I'm you know Chuck from Amazing Shears Boom, 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 here's my stuff. Uh, you guys got a good place to put that back there. And I don't offer to give them a business card. They always ask, do you have a business card? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I do. Hold on a minute. And now, I'm looking, always paying attention. Where are the stylists? Well, if they're around the corner, I'm going to try to get over to where at least one of them or two of them are going to be able to see me open my case. It does no good to open your case in front of the, the, the gal that doesn't do hair. Right. No good. I mean, you might as well just give her a card out of your pocket. Now, if you get up to the open, it's okay if it's on the floor. You know, sometimes you walk, well, I don't want to take up your space here. Oh, hey, how you guys doing? Something a little bit loud. Hey, how you guys doing? You turn away and ignore me. Uh, let me get you a card out. You know, I got my cards. They're buried. I got to move five things just to get my cards out. Did you do this on the floor? Sure. I do it where I'd like to do it on a chair. I love to do it on a chair. There's almost always a chair there. Work up. But I've done it on the floor, and I've had the style, and I've left my case on the floor, and the stylists go through like crazy. Chair for you. Yeah, usually it would be, you know, they got their sitting chairs, and that way I can get it up like this so that it's easier to see. See, now they're looking at that. 
Okay, I'm, I'm grabbing my card out. I'm going to leave the rest. I'm going to take one. I'm going to walk away and talk. Yeah, take your time. You're not in a rush. The faster you go, the faster you don't make a sale. So you, you just take your time, have a little fun with it. The, you know, you don't ever have to be, if you're in a rush, you make people not trust you. Anytime you're in a rush, people will not trust you. They, they, they start getting that barrier like, why is he trying to be so quick to get out of here? So I leave my case over there. It's fine. I know my case is full with 40 shears. So I'm coming in with 40 and I'm leaving with 40 unless I sell one out of it. <laughs> I like that philosophy. I come over, I got my card. Hey, here's a card for you. Now, by the time, if I spend three to five minutes between getting that open before I go back to it, if a stylist has not walked up to that case in five minutes, yeah, you're not getting nothing. But they will. Even if they didn't like you, they're going to come out right. and look at your shears. It just doesn't like matter. Like to me, that's just one easy way to get in the, the, the door. And now if you get anyone over there looking and say, you know, we got to try it before you buy it, sale. Huh? Nobody ever hear that. You can't try shears before you buy them. Sure you can. Uh, what are you using now? Uh, that's where you get pulled into the back room. What are you using now? And you just be assertive enough to follow the stylist wherever they walk. Because they're going to walk back to their station. You should try to walk back to their station too. Once you're at their station grabbing their shears and you're inspecting, you know, you're checking, fooling around with them. I like to always rub my fingers up and down the blade very carefully. And, you know, they always ask you, well, are they sharp? And, you know, and be honest, if they're sharp as heck, they might have had them sharpened a week ago. Don't tell them they're not sharp unless they're really were done wrong because people will call you out. I just had them sharpened and then you go and you test it yourself and you look like a heel. Be honest. But be, you know, look at them. They're good sharpeners after a while. You can look at a ride line and tell if that thing's cut or right. not. And that's where the silence starts because once you get their shears out of their hand and they've got work, they got to use yours. I want you to take every shear they have that you can get your hands on. If they might tell you, I got three shears, here's the one I want to sharpen. No, I don't want one to borrow. No, really. The factory wants you to try these while I'm here. There's a big problem in the world. When you go to the stores and Sally's and you buy a shear, you don't take it back if you open the box. Period. I mean, maybe if you got a huge account and you yell loud enough, they might do it once in a great while. I hear it all the time. Stylists complain, well, I bought these rounds. I bought this rocket dog. I bought this. I get it, and they, they try it for the first day, and they're just like, this is, this is not for me. Whether it's a piece of crap or whether it's a good shear, and it just didn't feel good. That's where our system comes in so much better, because we have the ability to let them use the shear before they buy it. While you're there sharpening, they have questions. You can answer them. You can sell on it. But now that's pretty much right there. With just that, you can almost stop and make money just by letting them handle the shears and use them. Yeah, normally I don't have any rhyme or reason to it. I don't like any rhyme or reason to it. So what I found is you're grouping. And when you group stuff, if you put all your colored stuff on one side of your case, it's not good. It's too much stuff in one spot. Spread it out, have a little fun. Oh boy. So yeah, this is something I like to do. You get in the salon, this, this and the fish bone are my favorite ones to get people excited. I take that back. And the big 80 inch curve shear. You never sell it, but man, does it get people's attention. Right. <laughs> it really gets their attention. So does this. If you can get back there and say, folks, you got to try this out. If they have a client in their chair, it's even better. <laughs> and the client's like, <laughs> clients love that. Yeah, they do. You will make a sale if a client likes a product in their chair. You will make the sale. They're going to be like, oh, I love the, that texture it brought out. This does whiskeys all by itself. You don't have to try as a stylist to sit there and, and go out of your way to do whiskeys. This also does thinning, blending, and any form of texturizing you want to work in between because they're professional stylists, they can do that. Start using, I call it jargon, industry jargon. Not your jargon that we have for being a sharpener. You need to learn their jargon so that it's more easy for them to understand what you're saying. If you come out and say, is anyone here doing any slide cutting? Are you doing any texturizing? They always have. They have to answer yes. There's, they cannot say no or they're not a professional stylist. Oh, well, you got to see this. What if you can do both at the same time? Folks who come in here. Now, most stylists, when you cut with the texturizer, close it, open it, and release. Folks, what if you could just do that? And 
That's it. You don't really care what they buy. You just want them to buy something. And preferably from you, because once you create the initial purchase, they will call you back. I forget what the percent. I was looking up on my computer because I track all my sales. And my second and third and fourth sheer sales to the same people accounts for 50 some percent of my business. And that's cool because you're not selling the second time at all. You're, you're just walking in, you're opening up your case, you're letting them you know, take out the shears and play with them and work with them. So, you know, but the most important thing is you got to get their shears out of their hands to do this properly. So I come in, I set up for my sharpening. You know, I got my table all up. And normally they don't rush over and start bringing you shears. They just slowly meander over with their shears. I like to actually walk through the salon, see you got any that need sharpening? Okay, okay, how many, how many, how many? I don't necessarily take their shears. I say, okay, who wants to be first? Then somebody always, I want to be first. You know, hurry up and get mine done. I got to leave first. As soon as one person starts bringing them over, the rest start bringing them over because they understand you're getting in line. Right. And it's, it's all natural. These are things you imply without saying. This is all, uh, somebody said you got to watch your body action yesterday. Key, you must watch body action. You know, if, if you lean in, they should lean in if you're on the same page. If you back up a little, they tend to back up a little. If you speak louder, you get their attention. If you talk softer, you get their attention better little things you can use. Watch their pupils on the eyes. As the pupils start to expand, they're paying attention. They're really looking. They're trying to hear through their eyeballs. And they do. They're watching your body language. Uh, appointment selling, I can't say enough about setting appointments. Somebody also talked about that yesterday. I make 20 phone calls a week now maybe, sometimes to fill in the spots. I get four, six, eight phone calls in a week for people to have me come out and sharpen. And then I just make my few little phone calls to fill in the, the dead areas. You know, somebody saying, how many appointments do you do in a day? I do two to three appointments a day. Just depends. So if I go far out of town, I might do four if I know I only got a few here and there. The reason I like to do that, I like to spend enough time in the salon. One, the longer you're there, the more they get to see you and they start remembering you. Two, it gives them more time to play with the shears. Sometimes it takes a stylist two hours of playing with a shear before they're going to snap and pull the trigger. That's okay. Uh, but if you're done in a half hour, you ain't going to sell it. You just, you're not, and if you're comfortable leaving it with them with no money, cool, I don't do it. I always have a check when I leave or at least two checks when I leave. Some guys like to work the big main areas. Some guys like to work the small areas. I like to work all of them technically. <clears throat> I got my big store chains, I got my small ones, I've got my individual shops, I got barber shop, a couple barber shops, this is one barber, that's it, that's one guy, you go in, you sharpen four or five clipper blades, you sharpen a couple old monk dog grooming shears or whatever they are, and, <laughs> and then you sell them one. Well, shoot, you, do you, I ask them, you cut hair wet? Well, yeah, I spray it down. Oh you need to try this one here and I'll, you know, if it's a barber, I might grab an A7, give them a big old seven inch convex shear and they open it up, they'll, oh. they listen for it, they don't hear anything and they're really impressed. And then when they cut hair with that from what they've been cutting with, and this is all why you have their shears, so that they're, that's wrong with garbage. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you got their shears so they have to use yours. So now he gets to use a high-end shear that he may never even put in his hand before because nobody was nice enough to say, hey, you should try this. And maybe he never went to the show, so he never run into Gene. you got to work on those people. You can make a lot of money in any shop. Any shop. i got a little area where you know 50% of the people are unemployed all year long, every year. This economic downturn did not affect any of them one bit. They were already broke. They're no more broke than they were before. They might, I mean, these people grow gardens in their own yards for a reason, you know. There's no money over there, there's no jobs. A stylist is one of the highest positions over there that's not executive. They make more money than most everybody in those areas. Think about that. People always get their hair cut. People will always get massages and their feet and nails done and all that stuff. 
Go after them. Who cares? It's a little salon. I went up to Ludington before coming here for two days. Four hour drive each way. Two days of work. I only had four appointments. Ended up doing eight appointments. Ended up making dang near $1,000 in 10, 12 hours of work. Four or five hours of driving in between salons because it's like 50 miles between salons, but you drive forever. Don't rule anybody out. Don't prejudge. Don't pre you don't know. I mean, you guys looking up here at me, I'm a new sharpener in my eyes. I've only been doing this for three years. I'm a young pup. There's guys in here who have been doing this for years and they're phenomenal and they, their sales skills are good for what they do, even better than mine because they've been doing it so long they just know what they're doing. That's cool. But you can do it yourself from your first day out. I sold shears before I came for training. <laughs> I didn't know anything, and all I did was say, here, <laughs> try these, I, you know, don't make sales so hard. So I call up your Chris's salon, uh, ring, ring. Chris's salon, I can help you. Yeah, hi, this is Chuck from Amazing Shears, uh, or sometimes I say, hi, this is Chuck the Sharpener, and I just stop at that. Chuck the Sharpener from Amazing Shears. I'm going to be in your area in the next couple of days. Uh, would you guys like me to stop in? Does anyone need any service work? So we just had a, a sharpener come in last week. Awesome! That's a positive. Great! So all your guys' shears are all nice and great. Would you like me to stop by and drop you off a new catalog? Sure, if you want to swing And that is always the answer. Sure! You're right. Free? Bring it! You know? And that's where my five... And I give everyone a nickel brochure. And the desk. Why not? It's a, uh, 20 cents when I get done putting my little label on it. <laughs> yeah, well, that cost us three times as much. <laughs> now, we want you to use those nickel brochures. So, so you do that little role playing. Now, what I've had happen is, because I've done a lot of phone work and I'm getting better and better, and I still get better and I practice and I learn new things all the time from myself screwing up mainly. You're doing that phone call, you might say, well, no, we don't really need any sharpening. Uh, but yeah, you can go ahead and stop by if you want. I get that a lot. I take that as a stop by. Right. You're only going to spend five, ten minutes there. Don't ever not stop by if you have the time to drop off a flyer brochure. You might walk out of there with five, six hundred dollars you didn't have in a half an hour. Because sometimes when you go into a salon and you're not sharpening, you're just showing the shears, <laughs> it becomes a faster process and I can't explain it. It just does. They're just, I don't know if it's they feel they need to pull the trigger faster. Uh, using your options, I offer a check thing where you can write me two checks, one for half now and one for half in three to four weeks or two weeks. I try two to three and four is on the long side. If somebody's seriously looking but they're just not sure, but I do need uh, your credit card number until I get them back. They're fine with that. They don't care. They know you're not going to run their credit card if you're a good business person. Not to mention they can just call up and get it schmiced anyways and they just take it out of your account. Use things to build trust. Leaving things behind can build trust. Coming back to get it and talking to them and being friendly. You probably might even get into sharpen if they start slowing down a little bit. But when they're running around crazy, it's the key to have your case open for them to get over at their convenience. Or that's when you go ahead and you grab one and you find one that's cut in hair, you say, hey, I want you to try this if you could. Could you tell, tell me what you think? This is a new product. Could you tell me what you think about it? That's why you, little, let people love to help people. You know, you only got so much time in a day, and I like to base my whole life on, I like to be able to be lazy when I want to be, so that means you got to work harder when you work, so you can be lazier later. <laughs> when I'm driving, I'm making my phone calls between 11 and 3. Or I'll stop, I'll pull off at a rest area and make my phone calls there and do my appointment book. This is my appointment book. I don't use a fancy planner, none of that stuff. You know, that's too high tech for me. On this, I can write down all the notes I need to know on a particular customer. Customer loved the Cobalt Classic, couldn't afford it. I'm going to see her in about a month. I'll pass this around. I put it in big writing right on my flyer. Try it before you buy it. And I do that and I get asked, what does that mean? What do you mean try it before you buy it? Because they can't try it before they buy it at the store. They take it home in a hang cell from the store, they open up the hang cell, they use the shear, they own it. Well with us, I give you 30 days, and now listen to the key word. Folks, when you buy a shear from me, 
you have 30 days to switch to any shear in their whole lineup. Now, I don't say that to necessarily every stylist, but if you got one that's maybe on the fence, they're like, yeah, I think I like them, but I just didn't get a chance to use them. But boy, I sure do like the way they feel in my hand, and I just can't really get a chance to use them. Well, shoot, you got 30 days to switch to any other shear in my line. The, when, to me, when you say the word, I'm a salesperson, wherever their personal shield was, it went up. Because you're selling them something. So now you have to bring your barrier down even farther. It's not bad. It's easier to get in the door as a salesperson. But I'm not looking to get in the door. I want to one time that. So I want to walk in there. I want to sharpen first if I can. Because once I show them how good I sharpen, these become more valuable. Right off the bat, I have a $500 shear you can use while I'm sharpening yours. Give them the big one. Heck, you're never going to sell it if you don't. I'm not out to sharpen my fingers off, personally. I'm out to sharpen what I need to do to make them happy and keep them working good and preferably with my tools and to sell them my tools. The more your tools you sell them, the more and more sharpening you get. And use every benefit the factory gives you. Uh, we were talking about, Bonnie about the button. I didn't bring my button. I'm so embarrassed. I wear my win a Shoto Shear button every day. Guys don't wear buttons. <laughs> Guys don't wear buttons. So every stylist asks, they always go, well, what's that mean? What's that mean? I've had people stop me in a restaurant. Win a show toe? What's that? You know, it's a shear for a stylist. Well, you might be talking to a stylist. There's a lot of stylists out there. I've sold shears at a restaurant. I sold shears at a bar once. It happens, you know. Uh, like Bonnie was saying, you never know. You might sell shears to the person sitting in the chair. I have done that, except it wasn't for the stylist. She, the person sitting in the chair bought the uh, K55 and the KTS, uh, the kaleidoscopes, the set with a case, with a razor, with a comb. About every dang thing I pulled out of my case to show her that went with it. She said, oh yeah, she's going to need that. Once they say yes once, it's easier to get a yes coming after it. Always follow that philosophy. Uh, and she turned around, she said, well, I'm going to buy that for my niece. She's going to school right now. Whoa, that was a $450 sale when I got all said and done. And then I had to charge the stylist for her sharpening. And then I sold another guy a shear over there because I couldn't fix his. Well, let me, I could have probably fixed him, but I made that decision that it wasn't worth the effort when I could sell him a new one. And he didn't want to do both. You know. So don't always rush out to sharpen their shear if they're debating buying a new one. Let theirs sit towards the rear because if it comes close, they may not do both. They might say, you sharpen it, you do it. And I've done this. I sharpened so good, it was so awesome, and I changed the angle. A previous sharpen took a full convex edge down to a 30 degree angle. So I, being the good sharpener I was that loves my customer, I'm modifying it back, trying to get it to a 40 at least. I'd like to get it to a 45, but I'm not going to spend too much time. I made it cut so good that she didn't buy the new one. <laughs> yeah. Who's okay. stupid there? You know, yeah, I got my $23 and I spent a half hour playing with that one shear for the $23. I could have shut up and sold a shear. Now you can buy the one that you're using right here. It comes with the full manufacturer's warranty, the one year accidental warranty, and I tell them a little bit about what it covers. And I over expect, the accidental warranty covers everything, ma'am, except for you taking a hacksaw to it and cutting it in half. That, it covers everything. I don't care what it is. All you need to do is provide a good story on what happened so we can talk about it at the show to try to avoid future problems. And they like that little stuff. Oh, really? You know, they, I've done two, two warranty this year. That's it. Two warranty jobs where somebody called up and said, ah, my shear's not right. Oh, well, it's a bumper. You know, go out, it's something silly. I had to sharpen one of them because it didn't cut through to the tips on a jazzy. Okay, it happens. But when I went out to sharpen that shear, I sold two more. So, again, never don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Talking yeah. Selling while sharpening is, to me, the try it before you buy it key. You're in sharpening, your shears are there, they get to play. You sell without selling. All the sell stuff I just told you about thinking this and thinking that, I want you to take all that garbage I was forced to learn all my life and throw it away. It doesn't matter. You don't need to use fancy techniques. You don't need to use anything. You can if you choose. 
what you need to do is let them use your stuff in every piece you've got. They want to try to raise your kid more raise. Let them use it. And they can buy the one they used. You get that one right out of the cash. Try it before you buy it. The benefit to that is, and you can ask anyone, you could buy 10 different shears that are the same, all identical, and out of the 10, mm, they're all going to cut a little different and feel a little different in your hand because that's the nature of everything. Now, I don't stock just that. That's only not even half of what I stock. I got a whole nother case that has, you know, the different sizes of those that are in that case, but it's also my, you know, the one like Gene uses over in the other room. So I can just pull them all out. I got my long shears in there and, and I like to do that. I don't like to overwhelm them with too much at once until I know I got some serious buyers that aren't finding what they want there. Then I'll bring in my other case and let them go. Now I don't stock as much as Bonica does and a lot of these sharpeners run around with five, six hundred shears. I'm not there yet. I will one day, but I'm not there now. Right now my goal is to have one of everything minimum and two, three, four of the things that I know I'm going to sell or that Bonnie and Jean tell me that they know I'm going to sell. And so far they've been right. They've never been wrong. Everything they told me has been true. So pretty much follow what they do. You know, you, you get some of these guys, like Ed's a super salesman. I like him. Ron's a phenomenal salesman. I like, you, you learn different techniques from everybody. Gene's great. I pick up new tricks at the show just listening to these guys. It happens. Then you incorporate it into how you're going to do it, which is where the role playing comes in. You know, pick on them. Have a little fun. They like that. Tell them they can't afford it. You can't afford it. I don't know. You know, maybe not on the show till, but pick something reasonable. Like they pick up the fish bone and they were looking at jazzies, and then they go to the. Oh, this is really cool. I gotta have this. Make a little joke. Ah, you couldn't afford that. Oh yeah, I could. Some people call you out on a bluff. Yeah, I can afford that. And they'll buy something just to prove to you they can buy something that they like. Especially when you give them the options. Always give your stylist an option. Always give your stylist a way to win and get out. You know, if, if they can't afford to buy something right now, you know, be careful with the things you say. But if you know they got money and they're just being boneheads, mess with them a little bit. Have a little fun. Put a smile. Always smile when you mess with somebody. <laughs> and it better be a good reason. I mean, you got to know you're being messed with in a funny way. But humor, it, it gets you a long way. I, Ed gets in salons just because he makes people laugh. I tell them, save your tips. When I come in again, you'll Save your buy. tips. And they smile and I just yeah. do. You know, oh, I don't have any money right now. That's okay. I take checks. Yeah. I didn't bring my checkbook. That's okay. I take credit cards. Well, I don't have those here. That's okay. Who do you know here that would loan you $23 for a Sharpie? <laughs> Laugh. It's okay. They're going to be like, damn, he's got to answer for everything. As long as it goes somewhat logically with what you're doing. When you're sharpening, you let them browse and encourage them strongly to try anything out that they like. I've had up to 15 shears out of that case at one time in a salon. Just, I was starting to get a little nervous. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's a lot of shears out of my case. But, you know, just buckle down and just go back and do my work. Don't bug them until I'm done. Each shear I got done, I would take that one individual shear back to whoever it was. And I got their big band-aid with my red marker written on it. You know, ouch, that's going to hurt. And then the price of what they owe me for the sharpening. And I'd give them their, their old shear and their band-aid. I set the shear down and I give them the band-aid so they have to read it. And they laugh, and they tell their client, and they laugh, and everybody's laughing, and it gets the room lightens up, everything gets better. You, you move on from that, you know, you're working, you're, you don't collect, you don't necessarily have to collect your money right then when you give your shears back. If you create the right work environment in your salons where you go, and I've been to black salon, Asian salon, all white salons, everything mixed salons, Indonesian salon. I've been in every type of salon, and I do the same philosophy for every one of them because I don't want to prejudge any one of them. I don't want to leave money on the table that I should have picked up. Short hair, long hair, medium hair, they got different charges all the way across the board. And I was just thinking, this is when I started putting it all together in my head, that's where I came up with charging my three different prices for sharpening. I use that as a sales technique. Why was my shear only $18 and hers was 23 Well, hers is a little higher end. Hers will do this, this won't. You want to try one? 
here you go, go try it. You make sales that way, you give them a reason to think about moving. Everybody wants the best. I want the best. If, I, if my buddy goes and buys a $1,500 TV, I want a $1,500 TV too. That's how people think nowadays. People are hooked on retail. Yeah, hey, that's pretty good, hooked on fine, hooked on retail. It's a game of getting them what they want at a reasonable price, but most important, you gotta get them to like and trust you to do the whole thing in the beginning. Now, the one thing we didn't talk about is the product knowledge part, which is something that you gotta have. I, I would request that each one of you go out and study your catalogs. Ask other sharpeners what the difference is between cobalt and molybdenum. Can you pronounce these things pro properly? If, as last night getting in the way. It, little things like that set you apart from other sharpeners. I sold shears in the beginning just because I had listened to what they said over the phone and I read the catalog over really good. I knew more about shears before I started sharpening than most sharpeners in my area just because I studied the products. I studied other products. I know which Bonica shear matches up with a similar Hikari shear, with a similar, well, I don't like to use the word Kasho, but I can't think of a different name, a similar Kasho shear. And you need to know that these are similar. Oh, well, I got this washi. Oh, yeah, I got one that's very similar to that, except for it's a little bit better in quality, and believe it or not, it's a little less expensive. Try this out. It's K55. It's a kaleidoscope. You're going to love it. It's a true Japanese steel shear that with color on it. The washies are true Taiwanese, I believe, or Korean, one of the two. Not that that's bad. Not that it's bad, but again, it's a selling point. You say Japanese, customer understands automatically 200 or more in their head. And the customers that tell you they bought Japanese shears for under $100, whatever. <laughs> You're, you know they're lying, and I know they're lying, and unless they found that one guy at the show that was like just giving stuff away. Yeah, that could be that too. <laughs> right. um, but the big thing is selling while you're sharpening because you're not selling, you're just letting them use it and they buy it. Uh, become a good order taker, number one. If you're a good order taker, you make more sales. Order takers, you know, like the guy that sits at the cash register, how may I help you? Did you want to pop with that? The guy who taught McDonald's how to say, would you like fries with that? Do you know how much money he got paid? He got paid millions of dollars to teach employees at McDonald's and places like that to ask them, did you want one or two with that? You know, do you want this and that? People ask for a discount. I get this a lot. Well, you know, 200 bucks, that's a little steep. I'll give you 150. Whoa, 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 whoa. I can't do that. I am so sorry. I have to follow rules. Then I break out my extra 10% for the ones that are in the case. It's, well, you know, actually, if you buy the one that I have here in the case, you're on the service route, you qualify. This would be $142, or $184.12 instead of $199. That's a lot better than $199. Even though it's not near what they wanted, you showed love. You showed an attempt. Now, I could turn around and I used to do the free sharpening. I just, in my own mind, I said, wait, if I charge for the sharpening and I give a less of discount on the shear, I make more money. And they, they win. So one of the I like you it. want to realize is that's why you're in business for yourself because you can set your, yeah. you know, the rules. And, you know, but you've got to be reasonable. Yeah, you know, yeah, if, yeah. if I go out there and start selling them half off, I'm killing myself. And if there's another Bonica sharpener in my area or another person selling them in my area, I mean, obviously, they're not going to make a damn sell for a while. But I ain't going to be in business very long. Give them their options, you know. Well, okay, I can't make this deal at 184.12 plus tax, but yet he made the deal at 184.12 out the door. You lost 12 bucks. Big deal, you know. But you sold a shear, and you're going to get back into service that shear in the near future. I use a lot of give and take, a lot of give and take, and you need to. It's called negotiations. You're in negotiations when you're selling. That's all you are is you're a professional negotiator. Here's the sale price. Here's this. Here's that. If you stand too firm on any one thing, you'd lose a lot of business. But you have to stand really quite close to being firm. Or firm but friendly. Firm but friendly. You know, that little extra discount might do the trick. That might not do the trick. They might need the sales tax off to make the tip also. When I give stuff away above and beyond my deal that I list, 
I take stuff away. Or I start adding stuff on. If I know they can afford it or feel they can afford it, they're beating me up on price. I'm going to turn around and say, well, you know, look at this nipper set. This is only $20 right now. you got to check that out, too. I'll, you throw them for a loop. They ask you for a discount. You raise the, pri you raise the total dollar figure of the, the sale by start giving them stuff. It gives you more room to take stuff away, too. Oh, I don't want that. Oh, okay. But now they sort of forgot about asking you for more money off because you put it up on a shelf. Anytime you think you have a problem, if it's a real minor thing, like somebody's beating you up on a discount, I even ignore the first one frequently. They just like, oh, oh, I didn't hear that. They ask twice or three times, they're pretty serious. Now, you, you, okay, they're trying to make a deal, less negotiate a deal. I can't make the deal. I need to throw in the sales tax to make a deal. I'm taking the case back, don't I? Yeah. And I do it, and they hug me for it. They love me for it. I help them out. And I got a case I can sell for $15. So when you do little things like that, you frequently give yourself more money, intentions. I give a lot of combs out. If I go into any shop, I order a lot of combs for this particular reason, to give them out to stylists just willy-nilly. It costs me a dollar, dollar fifty, whatever it is. Those little ionic combs. If I go in a shop and I sharpen for a lot of the stylists, even if they didn't get a sharpening, I will go and give every stylist a comb. Here, you got to try this. Here, you got to try this. And I always tell them, and the only reason I'm doing this is because I know you're going to want to buy one the next trip in. Make them laugh. Have fun. You know, tell them you're going to charge them money in the future. They love that stuff. But that's really where my generosity stops. I mean, one, two dollars. I, <laughs> I can only do so many bumpers in a day to make up for them combs I give away. You know, and they might say, I already got a comb. Give them a doo -woppy. You know, give them a whatever, give them an oil tube. But if you just attack every customer and, you know, firm but friendly or friend, in the sales, at the beginning of the sale is friendly but firm. The end of the sale is firm but friendly. That's when you're standing on your price. No, no, this is a good quality product. This is the price. I think the main thing you have to be is whatever, however you decide you're going to do things, you need to be consistent. Consistency. And, and because if you do it in one salon, and then you go to another salon and you make a different deal with them, and then you go to another salon and make a different with them, with them. Before you know it, you don't remember what you did in that salon the last time you were there. And they'll tell you, well, I, last time you were here, you sold me that $200 share for $150. And you don't really know whether you did or not. And you don't have your receipt book from back then. I'm there, I'm saying, no, I didn't. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> these are the prices I have. You know, using your numbers thing, I don't like to give any service away for free because I'm going to serve, do a lot of service work and I'm going to sell. Now I don't give any sales stuff away free either, I just make it sound a little better. That's all. You know, if they want to order it, it's 20% off, just like if it's on the internet. But yeah, give them the half off the retail price on the second one. Don't go half off your sale price, go half off a list. <laughs> the best thing you can do for that customer with that plastic handle shear, if you're really, really going to make a sale, charge them $15 to sharpen it and give them a sharp plastic handle shear and let them use it and watch how fast it goes dull. That, that's part of your whole education. People always ask me, well, why is it 15, 18, or 23 for sharpening when most of my sharpeners in my area charge either 15 only or 20 only, and there's one guy that charges 25 only no matter what it is. And I understand the all one price thing, and I may move to that one day, but I'm having too much fun playing with people. You know, why is my shear cheaper to sharpen than that? How come that was only 18 and that's this? That gives me a, they're asking me to tell them why they should buy a convex edge shear if they have a cheaper shear to sharpen. Well, yours is only $15 to sharpen. That's a basic bevel, use words. It's a basic bevel sharpening. That's, you know, that's your standard old fashioned traditional German style shear that's designed for cutting dry hair. Do you cut hair wet? They have to answer that yes or no. Now that's one case you're going to answer, you want a yes or no. If they say no, then you shut the hell up and go do what you're doing. But they're going to say, yeah, I cut hair wet or damp. Okay, let me show you. Do you slide cut? If you've got a bevel shear in your hand, you already know they don't slide cut. They have to say no. And if they say yes, I want to see them do it. I want to see the client going, <clears throat> What was that? <laughs> you get them, you give them, you know, if it's that point, you know they're in a $15 shear and they ain't gonna buy a $200 shear for nothing, go ahead and start them out on a jazzy. Here, you gotta try this, this is unbelievable. 
Uh, use big words. This is amazing. This is unbelievable. It can go good either way, but you're just using a word that opens up excitement in their head and gets them, you know, let's just go have some fun and play. Come and play with the toys. I don't call them shears. Sometimes I say tools. I call them toys. Because to the stylist that has four, five, six shears, that's exactly what they are. They're toys. Tip builders. Well, I've run into this. Great Clips is a good example. A lot of people go to Great Clips and they say, yeah, I can't get any good business out of the Great Clips because a lot of them have cheap shears. Well, that's just because you just got to get in there and start selling them better shears so you can sharpen them. I've got Great Clips. I started making one or two sharpenings with the manager who had shears and all the other people had switch blades and other things. Slowly but surely, I've graduated that Great Clips into being a very good salon for me. I've, everyone there that works there has bought at least one shear from me now. Some, the manager's bought six. He's in the drawing four times. He wants to win a show till I guess, you know, I'm cool with that. He bought other employees shears so he could get entered again. <laughs> he used to be a platform artist. He's a, now a manager for Great Clips. That's what he does. He doesn't do color, he doesn't do that. He swings his shears around and he cuts hair. That's cool, you know, he drops them a lot and I get a lot of work out of that guy and I encourage him to have fun. Do not pitch products till they narrow down the selection. That's part of not sticking your foot in your mouth. Uh, customer likes the cobalt shear, and then didn't necessarily like the price. You, the good salesperson and sharpener that you are, pick up a Nika or whatever you have that's similar handled, or a Pro Master in my case that's similar handled to it, and you step them down. Always start high if you can. It's easier to go down than it is to go up. It's rare when a customer bumps you. It happens, but it's rare. Mostly they bump you down, you start wherever you, if you start at 100, they want one for 50. I like to start high and work my way down because I find it's easier to not have to explain yourself on every single product. Way easier. In fact, I don't explain any products until they pretty much landed on one. I like the way this one feels. Oh yeah, that's a uh, Pro Master, that's Japanese steel with a molybdenum alloy impregnated into it. I use a little bit of my industry jargon, I use a little bit of their industry jargon so that they feel comfortable and I'm saying some things that they have no idea what I'm saying and that makes me seem important and knowledgeable. Whether I am or not doesn't matter, it's, it's all about perception, you know. You know, I've, I've sold myself out of shears many times. I've sold myself out of high-end sales. You know, I had a customer hooked on a cobalt and talked her down. Stupid. Make the sale. You know, they say they want to, they say, yeah, I think I like this. I think I'm going to buy this one. I think. No. All you heard was, I'm going to buy this one and go with it. Be assumptive in your clothes. That's what you say, do you want one or two? Yeah. Do you want one or two? Do you want the thinner to go with that? Do you like it five or five and a half? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five, five and a half, size clothes, anything, any trial clothes where you can give an option, where the answer is in your favor either way, is the best question you can ask. And they have to go out of their way to give you a negative response. Right. And anytime you ask questions, if you're going to ask a yes and no question, pretend you're a lawyer and make sure you know the answer before. <laughs> you want them to answer. Sometimes you want them to say no, but most time you want them to say yes because the more yeses a person says, they keep saying yes. Once they say no, you have to start over with the yes process of getting three no's to get the yes. In their eyes, if it feels the same in their hand and it cuts the same while they're there using it, whether it's 100 or 300, chances are they're going to buy the $100 one. But you always go with the more you spend, the better it is. Uh, but you can tighten that down with not necessarily the more, you could buy a Hikari for $875 or I can sell you this classic Cobalt for $399 and it's about the same thing. Except ours has a better warranty from a better factory who would bend over backwards to make you the customer happy. And, and I can service it here locally. And I can service it right here in your salon in front of you and you get to use it before you pay me. A lot of my clients, I don't collect my sharpenings. They bring it to me, willy-nilly. They just bring it, boom, here you go, here you go, here you go. They just come back and pay. I just drop their shears off and leave, and I, I don't take my shears back. I'll even give them and drop theirs off and let them keep playing with mine. So that's pretty, pretty much how easy it is. You gotta have, if they say they want to spend $200, you need to have a shear that's under 200 in your head.
You need to have a shear that's over 200 in your head, and you need to have a shear that's right in their level, in your head. Start at the top one and work your way down to the last one to sell it. It's just a process of trying to keep as much money in your pocket as possible.